all very much for, for being here. If you like, the only thing better than readers are listeners. <laughs> Thanks. I'm going to read short, having um, gone long yesterday morning. Um, and I'm, I'm also just reading excerpts from an essay in progress, um, one that was helped enormously by Kathleen's talk this morning. I won't say any more because I think I, you will see instantly the ways in which her talk this morning helped me. There's nothing you need to know in order to understand this essay except, uh, once again, it's not finished. And uh, it has never been read out loud until now. Uh, it, it's, its title, for now, is uh, my, my essay about joy. And there's an epigraph. Cookery books are the unconsidered diaries of family life, the everyday history of our civilization. Secular, earthly, holy books. That's from A. A. Gill's memoir, For Me. That's P. O. U. R. For Me. In May 1992, my grandmother had her gallbladder removed. That she would recover fully was what all of us, the doctors, her children and grandchildren, her longtime secretary, believed. Instead, she fell into a coma and died. That old story. Alive, she'd driven me nuts. The last time I saw her was when she summoned me to her office to kiss her goodbye before she got on a plane for the Mayo Clinic. I remember what she was wearing, her lady executive outfit, white sneakers, soft pants, a crisp white shirt with a stain on it. Her lipstick was crusted at the corner of her lips, probably from eating whatever had stained the white blouse. A jelly donut, maybe. She was diabetic. A jelly donut, definitely. <laughs> she moved toward me, I moved away. I'd just gotten an essay back from a graduate school professor. It was on <coughs> Kundera's Book of Laughter and Forgetting and it had no grade, just a comment scrawled across the top. Quote, you have successfully written 20 pages on the topic of irony without ever using the word irony. <laughs> she gave me some bits of china she'd been saving from my unborn baby, some Delft plates on the Moorish jelly jar. I said thank you. I did not say I love you. I would like to say that, like Lear's Cordelia, my love was more richer than my tongue. In fact, I was just in a bad mood. London, Paris, Athens, Santo Domingo, Rio, Montevideo, and Buenos Aires. Those are the cities my grandmother gave me. And she furnished my life at home with beauty, too. Antiques, furniture, paintings, haircuts, makeup, jewelry, a cashmere sweater she bought for me in college is still the most expensive item of clothing I've ever owned. The older I got, the more pressing the demands on my own life became, and the more I felt my favorite grandchild status as a burden. It seemed she was always calling on the phone or writing me letters, inviting me to dinner or to spend the night. Pick up a bottle of champagne on your way, she'd say. But when I was young, she was my refuge. There were five kids in my family, and my father was often away, working in the bush. My mother was frazzled by the demands of her job and my younger siblings. We couldn't afford to eat out, so she cooked every night, leaning hard on a handful of recipes, hamburger helper, spaghetti, tuna casserole. I didn't mind the food so much as the chaos. Every few days, I'd call my grandmother, and she'd pick me up on her way home from work. She and my grandfather lived on 80 acres a few miles north of Fairbanks, where my family lived. The drive between our houses could be short or long, depending on the hitchhikers. My grandmother always picked up hitchhikers, and she always drove them to wherever they were going, no matter how far away that was. Once we got to the farm, which is what we called her place, even though it wasn't really a farm, She'd start dinner while I soaked in a tub of Vitabath. Afterward, I'd put on one of the negligees that she stored in a wicker trunk, then sit down at the dining room table. In my memory, she was always talking and I was always listening, but I can't remember any of the words now. 
oven mitts covering her white blouse to the elbows, this I remember. She pulled a bubbling casserole out of the oven, lima beans and cream sauce. There might have been a slice of ham or green salad to go with it, but I didn't care. That casserole was my idea of heaven. The flat green beans browned and slid in the oven, sponging up the heavy cream. It was salty, savory, sweet. It was love in the form of a casserole. <laughs> If I'd known then what I know now that I will never taste its like again, I would have eaten until I was sick, hoping, as MFK Fisher writes in her essay Against Moderation, that, quote, an overdose of anything from hot chocolate to fornication would teach restraint from the very results of its abuse. <laughs> this is a segmented essay. It has, so it has subheadings. Here's, here's a subhead. A sentence stopped my heart. If my grandmother had been alive, she probably would have taken me shopping for a dress to wear to her funeral. As it was, I had to make do with a periwinkle maternity dress and a string of pearls. What I was wearing turned out not to matter, because when the bagpipes played Amazing Grace, my mother had to lead me out of the church and into a bathroom where she dabbed helplessly at the snot stains on my dress. That August, my daughter was born, the twins came three years later, and years went by. I thought of my grandmother often for a while, then less. Now it's nearly a quarter of a century since her death. The girls are grown, the husband is gone, and sometimes I want lima beans and cream sauce. I asked my father if he knew what became of grandma's recipes after she died, and he laughed at me. His mother grew up in Macon, Georgia, between world wars. The news that there were no recipes, not in writing anyway, is not wholly a surprise, but it is a disappointment. The cookbooks I use most often, Good Housekeeping, The Silver Palette, Moosewood, Otto Lenghi, 500 three-ingredient recipes, <laughs> yield nothing. I type the phrase lima beans and cream sauce into Google and get a recipe that looks like it might be right. In practice, though, the, burned, the beans turn out hard and chewy like nuts sprinkled into a white sauce that is too thin and also strangely sweet. I eat a few spoonfuls, then throw it away. The humblest cookbook on my shelf is The Joy of Cooking by Irma Bombauer. It's the fourth edition from 1951. My mother's parents gave it to her when she got married in 1962, and she gave it to me in 1986 when I moved into my first house. The book smells like a second-hand store. Its Confederate blue cover is held together by tape. All the pages are yellow with age, and some of them, especially in the section titled Pies Baked with Fillings, are stained. <laughs> the index lists two lima bean casseroles, one with onions and one titled, unpromisingly for my purposes, Mexican. <laughs> <laughs> there are recipes for lima bean souffle with bacon and tomatoes, for lima beans with mushrooms, lima beans with cheese, and plain lima beans boiled. Only one recipe interests me, even though I'm sure it's not what I'm looking for. I turn to page 270, and I read the first sentence under the heading, Canned Lima Beans with Piquant Sauce. <laughs> this sentence slays me. It throws me for a loop. It knocks me off my pins, bowls me over all of those cliches. Pleasure catches at my throat. I look around. There's no one to share it with me. I read the sentence again. I am transfixed transported, literally dislocated in time and space, because even though I'm sitting alone at the breakfast bar in my kitchen, this woman, this long dead woman, the author of my dowdiest cookbook, is talking directly to me. And here is what she is saying, quote, in order to provide a canned lima bean with glamour, must <laughs> <laughs> In order to provide a canned lima bean with glamour, you must do a fan dance. <laughs> <laughs> I 
next sub subhead, the eternal verities of American cooking. Irma von Starkloff was the daughter of a German-born physician who was also an American diplomat. Born in St. Louis in 1877, she was educated abroad in Germany and Switzerland. As a young woman, she fell in love with Booth Tarkington, but bowed to family pressure and married a lawyer named Edgar Longbauer. They settled in St. Louis, and for three decades, she threw herself into motherhood, civic improvement, and entertaining. A competent, though apparently not dazzling cook, she was intelligent, self-possessed, charming, dignified, and playful. Her daughter Marion told her biographer, quote, it is an open secret that mother, to the very end of her life, regard regarded social intercourse as more important than food. Edgar Rombauer was a delayed casualty of the stock market crash. He killed himself in 1930. Irma was 53, the age I am now, with three grown children and $6,000 in savings. She had never had a job. A year after her husband's death, she self-published The Joy of Cooking, a compilation of reliable recipes with a casual culinary chat. <laughs> Reviews were generally favorable. Said the St. Louis Dispatch, quote, it does not insult my intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> A few years later, Ron Bauer sold the rights to the Bob's Merrill Company, now Macmillan. The book was, and still is, a runaway success for its publishers in continuous print since 1936. Now, in its seventh edition, it has sold more than 18 million copies, which is about 10 million more than Gone with the Wind. <laughs> Sales from the book did not make Rombauer rich. She had negotiated the original agreement with Bob Merrill without consulting a lawyer. The terms were not favorable. But they did buy her cultural capital. Her biographer, Ann Mendelssohn, describes her as, quote, one of the eternal verities of American cooking. The eternal verities advice for dressing a squirrel. <laughs> Hold the tail down with your shoe and strip the skin off. <laughs> Her advice for buying seafood. There should be no unpleasant odor. <laughs> if in doubt about a fish, place it in water. A fresh fish will float. <laughs> Irma Rombauer's advice for things to do with leftovers. Make chicken feet soup. Poultry dealers, including, are still in a mood to give away chicken feet. <laughs> I know, so does that one. Make, make coffee jelly with marshmallows. <laughs>
He had a handful of items I can't conjure now, the fixings for a single man's supper. He tried to pay with a card, and it was rejected. He tried another card, and it too was rejected. He hunched around in his pockets. Nothing. He dropped his head and shrugged his shoulders and left. Years later, one of my students was researching food insecurity in Madison County, and one of the people she interviewed, an elderly woman, had been living four months on canned cat food. Irma Rombauer says, when our scarcity of domestic service was first making itself felt, I was approached by a woman of 70 who asked for help in realizing the ambition of her lifetime to know how to separate an egg. She died happy. Thanksgiving one year when I was in college, I went with my Aunt Care's family to the home of her sister Jane in Bronxville. The dinner was cooked and served by three silent African-American women wearing beige uniforms and white gloves. They did not speak to us, and no one spoke to them. Three years later, Jane was sitting at the dressing table in her bedroom getting ready to go out to lunch with friends. When she didn't come downstairs, one of the maids went up to check on her. She'd had a heart attack. At her funeral, people said she died doing what she loved best. Irma Rombauer's definition of eternity, two people and one camp. <laughs> advice for hostesses, quote, start with the dish that takes the longest time to cook and follow it up with the others requiring a shorter time. <laughs> Set the table in one of the intervals. If fruit is served after the dessert, the finger bowl is omitted at this time and the dessert plate has only the silver on it. In this case, the dessert plate is replaced with a fruit plate with a jewelry finger bowl, a knife, and fork on it. Serve hot food from hot dishes. Serve cold food chilled from chilled dishes. Keep calm, even if your hair striggles and drip unattractively. <laughs> Cocktails are essential. <laughs> they loosen tongues and unbutton the reserves of the socially diffident. <laughs> and so are canapes. Chutney and cheese, anchovy and walnut, anchovy and pickle, caviar and cucumber, codfish balls on toothpicks. Oyster and bacon, mayonnaise puffs, deviled burgers, <coughs> mock chicken sandwiches made from canned tuna. <laughs> As for hors d'oeuvres, serve them or not, but quote, remember that unlike the overture to an opera, it is unwise to forecast in this course any of the joys that are likely to follow during the meal. <laughs> Sample menus from the joy of cooking for lunch on a hot day. One. Vichyssoise, French bread, a fruit salad, or fruit dessert, strong hot coffee. Two, cold borscht, hot biscuits, this is Irma Rombeck's comment, unusual Russian-US harmony there, <laughs> cheese souffle, green peas, coffee, possibly a fruit cookie, or three, a quickie for effort, madrelaine with sour cream and herbs, a toasted ham and press sandwich, fresh pineapple sliced, laced with rum or something similar, and so on, and so on. <laughs> Irma Rombauer teaches me how to make someone fall out of love. It's March 1986 in Fairbanks, and I'm invited to dinner with my boyfriend's parents. I bring wine and flowers. The main dish is beaver tail stew, the side of jelly goose notes. The relationship ends. <laughs> but I will serve to any boy who breaks one of my daughter's hearts. Beef tongue with raisin sauce. <laughs> and it says, an unusual dish, delicious and inexpensive. <laughs> Ring mold souffle, poached eel, jelly pig's feet, half brain fritters. <laughs> Other possibilities. Hedgery of lobster, shrimp wiggle, lunchettes, donut hamburgers, onion shortcake, ragu fin, mushrooms under glass, rip tongue diddy rarebit, hot Tom and Jerry. Irma <laughs> Rombauer's French cooking for novices. Bain Marie, Blanquette, Bombay, Chantilly, Charlotte, sauce espagnole, horse meat, 
Tu me galantine, massive wine, maitre d'hôtel, nestle road, risol, turquina, the loot. Irma Rombauer's chemistry for housewives. Put an old piece of aluminum in a large pot or dish pan. Add two tablespoonfuls of salt and two tablespoonfuls of soda. Add two quarts of boiling water and put silver in water so that each piece is touching aluminum or another piece of silver. Let stand about five minutes until tarnish is deposited on aluminum. I've done it. That works. <laughs> How to Count Calories by Irma Rombauer. Three kumquats equals 35 calories. One martini cocktail equals 135 calories. Irma Rombauer on stains, how to get rid of. Pour boiling water from a height of two feet. <laughs> Irma Rombauer on common substitutions. Two teaspoons of arrowroot for one and three quarter tablespoons of flour. Irma Rombauer on how to live. Quote, your chances of success will be greater if you do not attempt the impossible and, if your, and your standards need not, need not be lowered in the least. Cold food is just as nutritious as hot food. Also, do not put buttered bread in the toaster. <laughs> <laughs> One day in the early 2000s, in Sweetbriar, Virginia, my friend Carrie, and I set out on a walk, leaving our three youngest children with the two oldest ones. The oldest were ages seven and eight. <laughs> when we returned an hour later, smoke was billowing out the kitchen window, and all of the children were crying. <laughs> they had tried to make jelly toast by, yes, putting bread and butter and jelly into the toaster. <laughs> Irma Bombeck, virtue, however admirable, is frequently dull. Peanut butter needs enlivening. Thank you. <laughs>